Welcome to Abolition Radio, the broadcast outreach of Love Never Fails, inviting you to join the fight to end human trafficking. Look in the eyes to see, look in me straight to lead, you give me all I need, so give me courage to believe. Each week, Abolition Radio sheds light on the darkness of modern slavery, celebrates the work of abolitionists who are fighting for freedom, and equips the church to engage in the work of justice with hope rooted in God's Word. Our goal is to see a radio audience become an army of gospel activists. You were in the neighborhoods we live in. You were in the ones we're passing by. You were in the ones we call our neighbors. And the ones who still sleep are right. Now, here's the host of Abolition Radio, founder and executive director of Love Never Fails, Vanessa Scott. Thanks, Dave, and welcome to Abolition Radio, the broadcast outreach of Love Never Fails. We are in for quite a treat today. Um, first off, I do want to thank my partner in justice, Vanita Hopkins. She, yay, she was actually, she was the host last week for our show, which was uh, about the Super Bowl committee, right? Yes. And yes. that went really well, I hear. It went really well, and I'm just so glad you're back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to be back. Um, yeah, so um, I definitely missed you guys, um, but I heard it was great, and if you didn't catch that be sure to uh go on to abolitionradio.org and take a listen to the podcast that's there but um we have a really special guest and um we're you know we're so uh blessed to be able to um, bring uh amazing powerful women and men into our um what we're doing and and learn from them and hear about their journey and um Miss Carolyn Russell from A Safe Place is here, and she has uh, just been blazing the trail for the Mm -hmm. last 30 years in this space, and so I just want to honor her and thank her for being on on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So um, we're going to learn about um, a variety of things today. We're going to talk a little bit about just, you know, Carolyn's journey, getting up to this place, and then some major um, accomplishments and and things that are happening with Blue Shields and and conferences that she's hosting coming up in October, and just a lot of good things that you'll want to be involved in and really um, learn more more about how um how you too can uh, can be a part of the change that you want to see so with that I'd like to just kind of go ahead and launch into asking you um, Carolyn how did you get started in this fight against I know you're from Louisiana right yes yes and um, so how did you get started in this fight against domestic violence well I started in in the field of social work I have a master's degree uh, and a bachelor's of course in social work so my goal has has always been to work with women and girls and more recently um, males as well uh, become more of a family advocate but Mm -hmm. starting out in the field nearly 30 years ago a little over 30 years ago the focus was women and girls because there was such um, a discrepancy in terms of services um, for particularly for victims of domestic violence a lack of services so I started it in as a social work advocate working with a safe place coming on board um, at a time where we weren't as diverse. Um, as you know, the domestic violence movement started with the um, <clears throat> the gay movement. Um, most people may not realize that the Battle Women's Movement came out of the gay movement, mm-hmm. which pretty much evolved from the feminist movement. Mm. So coming into this work, what I found was that we had very few if any, African Americans in leadership Mm. um, doing this work. Over 30 years ago, we had very, very few, if any, um, African American men doing any work around violence against women within the community. Mm -hmm. Um, So I walked into a program that was 99% uh, white and serving a percentage of 90% 90 African Americans. So I came in at a time when we just did not have African Americans in leadership doing this work, and right. I found that 
to wow. be very true. Yeah, I think I was I was watching a video and it talked about you being one of six leaders, African American leaders, uh, in the whole state. United States. Well, in the state of California. Oh, okay. uh, in the state of California. But again, but again, it's very very rare to find executive directors running domestic violence programs. So yes, we have about maybe five to six. Um, in that range in Mm -hmm. terms of California, but we are not in leadership. Mm -hmm. African-Americans are not in leadership in this work. Mm -hmm. I continue to attend state conferences where you may have two African-American leaders um, out of 90 African-American executive directors. So here again, this has not been an issue that African-Americans have historically embraced. So Mm -hmm. I have found that it's an issue that we as African Americans do not tend to want to talk about. Want to deal with. Yeah. So of course, when you come into this work, although we're serving the highest percentage of African Americans, those who are actually running the programs are white women, mm-hmm. and that's what I found, and yeah. that's that's what I found to be quite interesting when I came to a safe place. Yeah. So um, on that point, too, the 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 population that Love Never Fails serves is quite diverse. Um, you know, and ethnically. Um, gender and so on but I just find that there's um, there's definitely this this power connection that happens between I'm interracial so uh, my mom is white my dad is black and Native American but and actually I just did a profile on ancestry.com and I found mm-hmm. out that I'm like I'm like a gil- gazillion thing so <laughs> anybody out there you're probably related to me <laughs> <laughs> but um, I find that I connect in this very deep way with people that are interracial, other young ladies that are on, on the streets that are interracial that have had a similar experience to me. Um, you know, I may, I, I don't know what it is, mm-hmm. but it's just very powerful to have someone like such as yourself and a leadership role as an executive director over a domestic violence program and have an African American woman be able to see you in that position and be able to aspire to that position and know that you've come, maybe not from the same social economic background, but you've endured some of the um, ethnic challenges, the you know racial challenges that we all um, we all might experience, you know, as African American uh, women. Well, so. I can speak to that. I've been the token black, mm-hmm. and, and I've been okay with that. I mean, I am from Louisiana, and I do come from a social economic background that wasn't uh, upper middle class in no way shape or form, but I found my way in in terms of um, my education, in terms of my goals mm-hmm. and what I wanted to see myself accomplish. So yeah. coming to this work uh, has been extremely rewarding for me. We talk about diversity. Things have changed. Um, yes, we still have a, a need for more leadership um, for African Americans in this work, but at the same time, we still have a lot of diversity yes. that we did not have 30 years ago. So. Yeah. Yeah. You know, speaking today, we do have much more diversity, but still within this work, uh, African-Americans are a minority in leadership. Right. So here you are. You've come into this role. You're uh, MSW. You've been working in this space for about 30 years. I want to talk in a little bit and maybe in a, in a forward segment. I want to talk a little bit about your experience over at Planned Parenthood in particular. I, I, I find that quite interesting. And just recently we were asked to uh, present at Al Kalani's high school um, at a board meeting um, to talk about, uh, I guess, Planned Parenthood is um, in there um, and being considered. I don't know if a decision was made, but I think it was that they would teach them about sex, um, sex education. And um, and so, you know, I, which I think is great. But I also think that we need to um, make sure that the message includes some elements of talking about assess, you know, assessing the state of the home, assessing the state of your relationships. And I know you guys do a lot of teen um, violence prevention. Um, and, and so are you going into the schools as well and doing that? Oh, yes. We work with the schools. We work with organizations that serve teens, but predominantly the schools. We, we've done a lot of work within Oakland Public Schools, primarily, primarily Oakland Public Schools. Mm-hmm. Junior high and high schools, but we have also received some requests from elementary schools mm-hmm. around sexual harassment mm-hmm. and around some of the basic values that need to be taught to children around respect and those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. So, yes, in terms of 
our teen dating violence prevention program, you're right, we've done a lot of work. You mentioned Planned Parenthood, mm-hmm. and you mentioned it maybe in terms of how our agency may work with Planned Parenthood, and I'm not sure if you know this, but I also worked at Planned Parenthood yes. before coming to a safe place. Yes, mm-hmm. I knew that, yeah. And what I found, uh, I was actually a social worker, medical social worker intern, and uh, we had many young women who came in experiencing, um, I wouldn't say domestic violence because they weren't sharing it, but we did make some referrals to a safe place because there were times when we did have young people. I I will say the assessment was not there in terms of the team. We worked as a team. Mm -hmm. There was a social worker, the physical therapist, the you know, the nurse, and everyone did come together as a team. But domestic violence and teen dating violence was not on the radar at right, that time. Yeah. I mean, we have a formal teen dating violence prevention program that's been in existence over 20 years. But when I came to a safe place, we did not have that formal program in place. But we did receive calls from schools and from teachers often, and we still do. But, again, we have now a formal program. Right. right. And it's called Teen Dating, dating violence, violence prevention. Prevention. Awesome. Yeah. So um, maybe when we come back, we can talk a little bit about um, our uh, education program and, and and just brainstorm a little. I I like to do this, Carolyn. Uh, <laughs> sure. uh, on the spot, Put just you come on the spot. <laughs> co- come together and figure out how we can collaborate. So sure. um, we'll be right back with another episode of Abolition Radio. We'll be back with more Abolition Radio right after these messages from our sponsors. Welcome back to Abolition Radio, where you are invited to join the fight against human trafficking. And welcome back to Abolition Radio, the broadcast outreach of Love Never Fails. So again, we're here with our guests, Miss Carolyn Russell. Uh, we were just actually during the break talking a little bit about the uh, walkathons that you held uh, at the at Lake Merritt in sure. Oakland. And uh, we we had the opportunity to participate in your last one and set up a table. And there were lots of people out there just kind of encouraging one another. Um, So you're not going to continue with those, right? You've been doing them for 13 years? Yes. October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And for the past 13 years, we have held this walk against domestic and teen dating violence. Yeah. So for the past 13 years, we've done a lot of work to create awareness about this issue. We've really grown as far as the walk was concerned. And we thought it was a great opportunity. Yeah. Uh, Last year, we held the first national conference in the month of October. In October. Okay. So are you kind of shifting a little bit more? Yes, we, that. Are, gotcha. we, are. we see this as another awareness event on uh-huh. a different level gotcha. where we will be a- attracting more professionals who are working with victims of domestic violence in different arenas. Mm-hmm. Last year, it was domestic violence and faith. This year, it's mental health trauma and domestic violence. Wow. So we see it Beautiful. as an opportunity to mm-hmm. bring some national leaders here that's been doing great work in their own communities and sharing some of the practices and models and um those kinds of things with some of our local providers. That's That's wonderful. Yeah. You know, when we did our walk, um, we did a walk when we first started. I think we were six, eight months in um, over on International. And it it was definitely like a great way to invigorate. We had about 400 people, almost 500 people there. And we got everyone sort of fired up through that walk. Mm -hmm. And we did it in partnership with um, Californians Against Slavery. Mm -hmm. And... um, and but it's an awful lot of work and um and the you know imparting of the information that's the thing mm-hmm. i think that you know the expos and the conferences really provide a, a stronger platform for actually educating uh people so 
I mean, obviously we'd love to do everything, right? But we have yeah. to kind of pick and choose, especially as nonprofits where funding is limited and time right, is so right. um, so uh, so much of the essence. I have to definitely remember her yeah. for our next expo. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Just, We're going to pull you in. She's yeah, been on she, many panels. She fits right in. Yes, she Yes, she does. So, okay, tell us about your house. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm very curious. Um, yeah, I'd love to learn uh, how we can improve upon what we've started. We, as you probably know, we started the I Am House on March 16th of this year. We provide um, a emergency safe housing for uh, survivors of human trafficking and their children, five women and up to 10 children. Um, and we were full on the, on day one. And, um, you know, we, our program is a trauma informed program. So we have a, um, a clinical, um, uh, a, a PhD that's there mm-hmm. providing cognitive therapy. We have a psychosomatic therapeutic team that comes in. We just really have it very much infused. We have a clinical case manager on staff and, and a lot of uh, twelve step art uh, therapy, art therapy yeah. theater, ther- you know, theater, yeah. uh, arts, all throughout, and um, and then healthy. We have a trainer, so we've tried to infuse all these different things, and I think it's going quite well. But there's always room for improvement, especially from somebody who's been doing this for so long. What, what words of advice would you give to us? I guess I'd question confidentiality mm-hmm. and if, uh, if if it exists, how mm-hmm. does it exist? Mm-hmm. How you know how does that? How do you keep the place confidential? Is there a safety issue? Is there safety planning involved? Mm-hmm. Is there a need to be? Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> we have um, three phases of our housing program and. The first phase is four months, and it is at a confidential, undisclosed location. And we have whoever comes to the house, they have to sign an agreement saying that they will not disclose where the house is, including the residents. Um, and so we're pretty serious about that, um, um, even to the extent that there's some legal um, implications in the signature, in the document that they sign. Um, and then, um, and then of course we do not, um, you know, just let anybody come in. We, it's only the people that are designed to be there for the purpose that they're supposed to be there. Because when you're dealing with people with high trauma, you don't need to have a lot of in and out and a lot of, you know, this and that going on. So the four, first four months is extremely, it's kind of a rigid program structured, I should say. Um, and that's by design because we're detoxing them off the life. We're, there's no f- cell phones. There's no internet. There's no um, visiting on site. Um, all of that is done off premise, and um, that again is by design. And um, and then when you go to phase two, that's where we call that the sustainability phase. And when you go to to that um, house, then and we're actually hoping to get some incremental funding to be able to open that because we haven't yet opened it. We, we're going to have three young ladies that are going to graduate in uh, three weeks and be ready to go into phase two. Um, And um, actually uh, we are, um, we're lobbying with the Alameda County supervisors to support us so that we can Mm -hmm. open this house. Mm -hmm. But in phase two, then you're going to have more in and out a little bit because people have to go to school and work and all of that. And so that's where I was hoping, because I believe your program supports a little bit more interaction with the outside world. And so if you have any words of wisdom for us as we contemplate that, you've been doing this. so Well, our program is a 90-day program, 60 yeah. to 90 days. And, of course, 60 days. And if you work in the program or we evaluate your progress, you can stay up until the, to the 90 days. Okay. We do think that confidentiality is important, mm-hmm. but it's also important to have <clears throat> the initial stay, but we have 72 hours where the person cannot go out, receive phone calls or what have you that is an opportunity for them to just calm down and begin to get acquainted with their new surroundings Mm -hmm. Um, we think it's critically important and it depends on the length of your program Uh, for us after the 72 hours because they are adults and they are not children or minors many of them are working and if they're not working then we are actually trying to work with them. We have a CalWORKs program, so we have a job developer, job readiness, to work with them around becoming either employed in getting into training or what have you. So we have someone who begins working with them. Mm-hmm. So, of course, and they have children. So, of mm-hmm. course, right. if their children are needing to go to school, mm-hmm. right. 
they have to take their kids to school. So mm-hmm. there, there's a different type of uh, dynamic, I think, because we're dealing with adults with children. So, yes, they are allowed to go out after the first 72 hours and begin to interact. We have um, designed the program for safety reasons. We want to make sure there's a restraining order in place. So when she does go out to take care of her business, take her kids to school or what have you, if she does encounter the perpetrator, there's a restraining order in place. So what we're trying to do in those 72 hours is to get all of those things in place. If she does not have a police report, we need to make one. Mm -hmm. So that when she steps out of the program, we're not with her. And she needs to have those protections so that if anything occurs, she can call law enforcement and she has documentation. Mm -hmm. So we want to create all of those safety Mm -hmm measures for her so that once she starts moving out and taking care of business she can move around freely again we're dealing with a different population right. and in terms of how we work with human trafficking because they have to be 18 to come into our program mm-hmm. or uh, emancipated mm-hmm. um, so we have often re- asked the question um, how is your team program uh, different from a human trafficking program how do you interact with human trafficking our team dating violence prevention program does a lot of education Mm -hmm. and within that we focus on human trafficking Mm -hmm. what we find is young people and for the most part when we talk about human trafficking i think you're talking 18 and under well no actually so our youngest uh is is 11 and we go all the way up to uh, uh, you know, fifties. Okay, so yeah. you take uh, you take women that who've been yes. human and trafficked, men. and men. So for us, we have adult women who who have been human trafficked okay. into this country. Yes. We have many Asian women, for the most part, women of other nationalities that have been brought here. Yeah, and most often have been put in an apartment or somewhere, and then they become abused, and that's where we begin to work with them gotcha but with with young people uh who are involved in human trafficking relationships we find that they are considering themselves in a relationship right you know even though it's the the perpetrator that's really causing them to um to prostitute or to sell their bodies they still begin these relationships most often with someone that they care about yep and who they begin to love yeah so we begin to look at how is it different you know yeah. how is it different to be in a relationship with one person and believe that you're in a monogamous relationship and you begin to be abused by that person right most of the time they pull them in and for a period of time they believe they are the only one right yeah the trauma bond the tra- yeah. exactly so we'll be right back with another session of Abolition Radio. We'll be back with more Abolition Radio right after these messages from our sponsors. Welcome back to Abolition Radio, where you are invited to join the fight against human trafficking. And welcome back to Abolition Radio, the broadcast outreach of Love Never Fails. So we just wanted to clarify, both Carolyn and I, that while we do provide services to men, right, at Safe Place, a Safe Place, and also in Love Never Fails... Uh, We do not provide uh, housing for for men. So we just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Um, We are um, hoping to, like we partner, for example, with Covenant House, who provides housing for for men uh, that are 18 to 24. And we partner with uh, Dreamcatchers that provides housing for um, uh, uh, commercially sexually exploited children and homeless children in general, including young ladies and young men. Um, we also, um, there's a, I believe there's a home in San Francisco that, um, specifically caters to LGBTQ, 
uh, community in um, and including, you know, men and women. So with that in mind, um, let's go back to something you were talking about, Carolyn. Um, you were kind of saying that the women, young ladies, oftentimes think that they're in a monogamous relationship. And that's, you know, as you know, uh, Romeo pimping is the way, what mm-hmm. that's typically called, where, you know, someone pos- poses as a, a traditional boyfriend um, and um, and then sexualizes a relationship, does things that perhaps the young lady is uh, ashamed of. In many instances, I've heard this many times where it's starting off where he's breaking her down and he's learning, you know, all of her likes and dislikes and things about her family that are missing. And he's already mm-hmm. noticed you know, he's assessed mm-hmm. her from day mm-hmm. one and noticed that she has vulnerabilities. She's uh, maybe not dressed the way that she might want to be dressed or she might hang her head low or perhaps she's overweight or, you know, something something that he is preying upon or she is preying upon because there are f- female um, exploiters. Yes. And um, and then they, you know, bring the relationship to a place where the, the person either uh, feels like they, they can't live without that person, right? Or they... Uh, or they um, even coerce or threaten them, um, saying that I know where your family is, I know where your little brother is. So that that whole uh, bit is something that you've seen, I'm sure, um, with the human trafficking survivors that you're providing services to. And well, can, can I just jump in here that not only you mentioned um, those who have who come into the country, but a lot, and I would say the majority of, of what we're dealing of with, yeah. whom we're mm-hmm. dealing with, are native domestic our domestic youth here right here in the bay area Mm -hmm. and um so it happens on a broad spectrum yes it does happen with that international flair but it also is happening right here with a u.s of a flair oh yeah yeah Mm -hmm. i mean you know we can look at east 14 and international boulevard and do a whole program exactly around what's happening in oakland Uh yes so yeah, um, yeah, we're out at, right out there with them. Yeah. But I think even with victims or so, well, victims who come into our program, sometimes it takes, you know, the first week or two to even decide whether or not they want to stay. Exactly. Right. So normally, the first few weeks mm-hmm. will be determining factor right. as to whether or not they will even stay with your program. Yes. Yeah. And there are so many different factors that are are involved in uh, someone choosing the decision or making the decision to stay. And so we find that it's some of the most important time it uh, is. to be available mm-hmm. to our clients when they first come into the program. Yeah. Um, some women have never slept alone. Some women have never left before. There may be other dynamics. Sometimes we most often um, are not dealing with African-American or white women. We're dealing with women from other cultures. We're mm-hmm. dealing with African women. We're dealing with women whose relief and faith has a major impact on their decision making. Mm-hmm. We're dealing with women, most often women whose families are sometimes supportive of the Stay abuse because right. of the uh, benefits that yeah. a family could be getting. Right. So many of the families that we deal with are often dealing with family right. support issues. Familial. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and many know. times they have a major impact in some of the services that they may need if they are like Ocean or Vietnamese or Mandarin or mm-hmm. some other Asian uh, population. It could be a small population. And so to seek help in that population, everyone knows everyone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there's yes. so many dynamics yep. to deal with when you're dealing with these um, yeah. communities of yeah. color, communities of color. Yeah. Yes, yes. So I want to shift a little bit and talk about some of the things that you've been doing in terms of um, rallying uh, the community to support what you, this work. Um, again, um, very impressive. Last last November, you had a national uh, faith based conference in November, right? Yes. And um, and so you know, this is something you hope to do. Um, not necessarily the same uh, theme. But this coming October, right? Right. And so, tell us a little bit about what you did last year and what it started, and, and, and in particular, this thing with Blue Shield. I think it would be sure. really good for people to learn more about. Well, we've historically tried to reach out to various institutions around domestic violence. You know, when I first came into this work, we were not at the table with law enforcement mm-hmm. or the district attorney's office, and now here, 31 years later, we have partnerships, we have wow. working agreements. Well, the faith inst- faith institution is another institution that we needed to reach out to. We've had a history of providing outreach to local churches, maybe go and do some education at seminary schools. But for the most part, faith-based leaders have needed to be 
educated around mm-hmm. this issue, we find that people who are in crisis tend to turn to their faith. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter what race or ethnic group you're from, most people turn to their faith when they are in crisis. So we find that faith-based leaders are in a position of power mm-hmm. because most often and historically, unfortunately, the church has played a pivotal role in condoning violence. We can go back to the rule of thumb when it was law to beat your wife as Mm -hmm. long as it wasn't with anything larger than your thumb. So the church played a major role in that. We have a history of church leaders sending women back into homes Mm -hmm. and not really understanding what domestic violence is all about. So what we've been doing over the last many years is trying to get faith-based leaders to become more educated around this issue. And more and more, we're getting funders on board to recognize that the faith institution is a critical area that we have not focused on. So last year, for the first uh, time, we were able to actually sponsor the first national conference around faith and domestic violence. So I was actually able to bring some of the partners that I've been working with on a national project through the Institute on Domestic Violence in the African American community through the University of Minnesota. Mm. And I've worked with this project for about four years. The Institute has chosen about 15 cities nationally that have a high prevalence of African Americans and domestic violence. Oakland was chosen and I was asked to be the project leader. So for the past four years, I've convened in different cities two to three times a year with these other project leaders who have extensive experience for those projects are faith-based. And we were able to bring them here. They have training around domestic violence, but most often, uh, most important, they have created best practices, models that they're actually using in their congregations to deal with victims and perpetrators. Mm. So when you have a couple in your congregation and domestic violence is occurring, what do you do? What practices do you have in place, Mm. if any? So Blue Shield of California has launched a national, I'm sorry, a statewide project on domestic violence in cultural responsive Communities. In other words, Blue Shield has received an enormous amount of funding to focus on uh, culturally specific uh, populations. And so their focus is tribal communities, recent immigrants, and African Americans. So the project we have is faith and domestic violence. What we're hoping to do, we've received the grant, is to bring some of our national um, partners who have created practices within their congregations to conduct trainings here in the Bay Area with some of our local faith leaders. Uh, This would be a two-year project that Blue Shield is supporting. So educating faith leaders, helping them to develop practices that they can use within their congregations. And it's been well received by some of the congregations in Oakland and um, the surrounding area. That's awesome. Yeah, um, you know, I think it's something that um, most of the churches that we interact with would would welcome. Um, We've done some level of education in terms of abuse prevention uh, and human trafficking awareness, but I think domestic violence is so important uh, to kind of integrate that into what we're doing. Um, And, I mean, it's just essential. to. I mean, I've seen it over and over again where people are involved in a domestic violence situation and because, you know, uh, you know, the, the, the Bible says that the Lord God hates divorce. Mm-hmm. People are, you know, uh, sticking around and um, not allowing, um, you know, themselves to hear from the voice of God saying it's OK to step away and not accept this type of abuse. You're 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 precious in my sight. Anyway, we're, we will be back. We have, <laughs> we have to stop. We will be back in just a moment with another session of Abolition Radio. Thank you. We'll be back with more Abolition Radio right after these messages from our sponsors. Welcome back to Abolition Radio, where you are invited to join the fight against human trafficking. And 
welcome back to Abolition Radio, the broadcast outreach of Limb Never Fails. So um, we, we were just talking about the churches that we collaborate with that um, have really opened up. And, and I can't say that everyone um, has professed to know what human trafficking is about or domestic violence is about or abuse is about, but they want to be educated. They want more information. And so the, they have partnered with Love Never Fails. Um, that's, you know, Faith Fellowship Church in San Leandro, Oakland City Church, the Fountain, uh, Oakland City Church in Oakland, uh, Fountain Church in Pleasanton, um, Temple of De La Cruz in Hayward, Glad Tidings in Hayward, Lift, Lift Ministries in Hayward, Cornerstone, Cornerstone Livermore. in Livermore. These churches, I Cole think, MF. Cole and Meth in, in, in Palo Alto. Um, these churches and organizations and faith faith um, organizations communities, and communities yeah. are 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 um, saying to us, um, teach teach us how to, um, you know, one one of the concepts that came up. I had Pastor Gary Mortera from uh, Faith Fellowship come onto the show, and we talked about trauma informed sermons. And um, mm-hmm. I got the uh, I actually got the idea um, after talking a bit with. Uh, with Mark Fisher, who's a, a leader in this in in human trafficking and and uh, just doing a bunch of mm-hmm. things, previous director of the Red Window Project. Do you know Mark? No. Yeah, he's awesome. So he's actually graduating from seminary That's right. in about two weeks. But anyway, uh, hi Mark. Uh, but he, he he and I were kind of going back and forth about um, some of the stories that come up, and you know, a pastor might be sharing them in scripture. And depending on how he he or she talks about that can really start to lead the congregation in a direction that advocates for abuse, advocates mm. for uh, trafficking, for prostitution and things like that. Like I was just um, I was just reading in Proverbs the other day and it was talking about how, you know, the the seductive prostitute comes and and she says you know i'm i've prepared my bed with petals and 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 it says be careful that you know you're not ensnared by her young man and it's speaking about you know staying with your first wife and don't be ensnared by the prostitute and 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 on one hand i was thinking that's really good because we do need to teach our young men about uh, the ways in which they might be seduced but then I also was thinking, how would it feel to be someone who had been exploited, who had been taught to do that? And, and I started to even think about what happens at home when that before that lady uh, went out, she said her husband had taken all the money and gone away for the weekend. Think about that for a moment. How many people do you know um, have their husbands gone away for the weekend? Maybe he had been beating her all weekend long and he's taken all the money. So now was she supposed to live on all mm-hmm. week long while mm-hmm. he's gone? Who knows what he's out doing because he's in a position of power and mm-hmm. she, she, she's got to live with whatever resources have been left to her. So now she's out here being, you know, being seductive mm-hmm. and she's viewed as almost painted as this devilish demonic person. Um, but she may be doing that to survive for the week. We don't know if she has children at home. We don't know what her predicament is. And so having pastors begin to open their minds to all of the, 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 you know, the possibilities. Like I think about Bishop T.D. Jakes. I'd love to get him on some of this because uh, so I'm call- T.D., if you're listening right now, you, you heard it from me. I'm requesting your presence to talk about this on the abolition radio. Show. No, but uh, really, um, you know, he, he, he sometimes in his, the way he's, he talks, he fills mm-hmm. in the blanks. Yeah. Because there's, there's scripture, and then he, he really paints a picture about what was happening culturally. And what does that mean when he took all the money? It says he took all the money and went for the weekend, meaning and, and the way it's being interpreted is almost, or it, it sounded to me, was almost like, he, you know, because he took all the money, he's gone for the weekend. So you can come to my house. But in my mind, I'm thinking, he took all the money. How are you going to make ends meet? Mm-hmm. Right? And so financial is abuse, uh, financial uh, uh, abuse. Yeah, is Econ- a, is 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 real economic abuse, economic yes. abuse yeah. is real. Yeah, well, it is because, you know, m- many women, even if they're married, uh, once they leave, most women go into poverty. Just right. the fact that you've left takes you into a whole nother social economic status. That's right. And so 
And so, you know, there's such a connection between mm-hmm. domestic violence. It's almost like phase one. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, mm-hmm. it's like you're in this, you start off and you're a child and you're being abused at home by family or close friends because it's often that those individuals. You get, you're being taught how to be abused. Then you go on to a domestic violence, abusive relationship, marriage, um, you know, baby mm-hmm. daddy, whatever it is. But you've got this scenario that's beginning to teach you uh, or reinforcing those same messages. And then and you've got a child now or children that mm-hmm. you're caring for. And now you're pushed into a state of poverty mm-hmm. because you can't model because you, you don't know how to model. Right. For that child. Right. So. Correct. In terms of the economic abuse, um, many women are put in that situation. Women come into our program and they've never had to pay a bill before. Mm-hmm. They don't know how to get their PG&E turned life on. Yeah. Um, they are pretty much crippled right. mm-hmm. in right. terms of life skills. Yeah. You know, using the scenario you mentioned about the scripture and about the word, a lot of times um, they're triggering for some victims. Mm. You know, you don't even have have to go into a long scenario about it but that very little thing she could have been further along in the process but just by going there and maybe not elaborating more Mm -hmm. it's triggering for her and even to your point about those who come that don't even know how to say buy groceries or whatever Mm -hmm. um, by themselves that can happen even in a positive in positive situations you know I mean I know someone who's um it was a long time ago, yes, but whose spouse passed away, but the spouse was the person who Paid took care of everything, yeah. you know, took took care of all the bills, bought all the groceries, did all the driving. And, and you know, so it wasn't a positive thing because when we true. look at it, and I've seen situations like that 30, 40, 50 years, and she's left crippled. Right. True. For the most true. part. That's uh, true. And you but, see that even with children. Sometimes parents, yeah. you know, do too much for their, their kids. Sure. And then their kids don't know how to live independently. I have been, yes. I have been cured of that. Yes. <laughs> but I did have that problem with my oldest son. And so um, anyway, so but just tying it back to your conference, your faith initiative conference is like, it's so important. Like the dialogue that we just mm-hmm. had. Right. Right. We need to create safe places yes. for people to have those kinds of dialogue. And the church needs to be that place. I mean, people need to feel that this church or congregation sets a tone yes. that they will not tolerate abuse. And I think that's what I've gotten from some of our national leaders that I've brought here. Mm-hmm. They've created these practices within their congregations. And those members know that this is a place that they can feel safe. That's this great. is a place they can come to the minister. But if the minister doesn't set that tone, mm-hmm. either through the pulpit or through some type of outreach programming mm-hmm. with the domestic violence program. You know, I've had ministers, and I'll mention one is uh, Reverend Mayberry in Oakland, California, mm-hmm. uh, at uh, First AME. Mm-hmm. He does preach about domestic violence from the pulpit. Mm-hmm. And I think it's really important for members to hear that and yes. to know that this is a leader that will really support me if mm-hmm. I'm in crisis. That's yeah. good to hear. And I, I think, you know, when we had Pastor Gary on, he did the same. He was yeah, he willing did. to just kind of divide the word and say, uh, you know, this is why if you're going to talk about this story, you got to make sure to right. cut, put this in it or it begins to look like you're saying it's OK for this person to be treated right. this way. So I appreciated that uh, very much. Those pastors that are stepping up, um, uh, you know, we can't thank you enough. Mm-hmm. Le- pastors and leaders, just keep doing what you're doing because uh, we need you out there. Um, you know, being the the voice of, of, of God, yes. uh, so to speak, uh, into the congregation and leading them towards safety and healthiness. You were going to say... I just wanted to say also we have a community counseling center, which is a non-confidential location where we do see people uh, for counseling and therapy, and most are still in the relationship. But we do see a percentage of uh, deacon wives and uh, we first ladies. And mm. so we do know that the church continues to condone violence some do not, and we applaud those that do not. But we know that within our shelter program and within our counseling center, half of the con- half of the population are mm-hmm. members of congregations mm-hmm. and are either deacon wives or very involved in the church. Mm-hmm. And this is what we're getting from our clients. Yes. Our shelters are full of people every Sunday that's getting up and going into some church. Wow. 
Yeah. Okay. So we'll be right back um, in just a moment with some more events and things, the ways that you can get involved. Be sure to like our page, Abolition Radio, on Facebook, and check us out on loveneverfailsus.com. We'll be back with more Abolition Radio right after these messages from our sponsors. Welcome back to Abolition Radio, where you are invited to join the fight against human trafficking. And welcome back to Abolition Radio, the broadcast outreach of Love Never Fails. So we have quite a a bit of... uh, uh, or, or opportunities, I should say, for you to get involved. And um, Carolyn, you have an event. We were kind of talking about it earlier in October coming up. Um, where can people get involved with that? October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. It's the one month throughout the United States nationally where domestic violence providers come together. And we really are trying to recognize those who have lost their lives due to domestic violence, mm-hmm. recognize the work that's currently being done, and to um, energize the community around this issue. So we take that opportunity to have an event. And in the past years, we've had the Walk Against Domestic Violence. For the past year, we've now conducted a national conference. This year, the conference will focus on mental health, trauma, and domestic violence. We see that as a topic that we need to talk about. We need to have more conversations around mental health and trauma, and most of all, how it correlates to domestic violence. So we will have this conference. It's on a Safe Place website, uh, Eventbrite as well. The conference will be held at the California Endowment October 23rd. And you can get more information on a Safe Place DBS website, and that is a Safe Place uh, DBS.org. Cool. Okay, and that's D as in D- DVS Domestic Violence, Violence Services. Services but it's org. an acronym, DVS dot org. Okay, great. Um, and so, Benita, you've we got some other stuff going on. Yes, we do. Um, for those of you who are listening in, last week uh, we had the Super Bowl um, host committee and Super Bowl work group here, and we urged those. We're looking for many volunteers to work um, during that time. So go to our abolition uh, radio facebook page and first like it and then let us know you're interested in volunteering and we can forward that your information over to the committee on that we'll forward you to that website to log in yourself and our collaborators um, the south bay coalition to end human trafficking are having two conferences coming up here really soon on the 15th of july this is a free training opportunity for anyone interested in best practices for providing victim-centered and trauma-informed advocacy and support for human trafficking survivors. July 15th in San Jose at 591 North King Road at the Family Resource Center there, and it's from 1230 to 430, and lunch is provided, and it's all free. Be there. Free food? (laughs) I'm there. (laughs) The other one is for um, those interested in learning about and how to take action in the fight against trafficking on September 18th uh, at the Mexican Heritage Plaza in San Jose as well. Um, The coalition is putting on a conference for all spheres, uh, law enforcement, uh, victim services, um, and all of us who work in the fight against trafficking. So more on that to come, but don't forget also our upcoming concert at Temple de la Cruz on August 8th. So hope to see you there, and you'll be hearing more about that as well. And then also our Love Never Fails Action Network meeting That's is right. tomorrow. Yes. Uh, and we are calling it Freedom Sunday. Yeah. We have actually invited two of our thriving survivors to come in and share a little bit about their story 
Um, and I believe one of them is going to recite a poem. So oh, I'm kind cool. of excited. We're going to have a little few s- snacks. It's going to be a very brief meeting because it is, uh, you know, uh, Independence Day and uh, weekend. We, yeah, weekend. And uh, we're we're excited that you're probably out listening to us right now from uh-huh. a fair or carnival and enjoying your weekend. But just come stop by and hear from two of our thrivers tomorrow um, at 2.15 to 3.15 at Lift Ministries, and that is 22580 Grand Street in Hayward. Uh, Cross Street is A Street. And I did forget mm-hmm. our outreach yes. on the 18th. Yes. We'll Leaving be- Faith Fellowship, 577 Manor Boulevard, San Leandro. And leaving at 6, well, we're starting our training at 6.30, like yes. we always do, and we will be leaving around 8.30, yes, 9, 9 o'clock. o'clock. Yeah. And we are going to be in the East Bay this this month. Okay. Uh, we went to Stockton um, last, month. last month. We were out with, at Ripon um, yes. truck truck stop and handing out truckers for uh, trafficking. Um, truckers truckers against trafficking. Truck, truckers against <laughs> trafficking. Sorry, tat. <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, the stickers for their bumper stickers. And uh, we want to get out there and hit um, the various locations. We're not disclosing where in the East Bay just yet. But we're going to hit out, head out together at around uh, six thirty for the training, eight thirty for the um, for getting in the bus and getting on our way. And so, please do join us there. Also, I just want to uh, remind you to like our Facebook pages. So that's Abolition Radio. Um, also, Love Never Fails. Yes. And check out our website, Love Never Fails Us dot com. Yes. Um, and of course, we want to invite you to go to a safe place, DVS dot org, to learn more about Miss Carolyn Russell and her beautiful program, A yes. Safe Place, um, who is doing so much to help those that need it. Um, dearly so um, please support her and thank you again for listening to abolition radio and if you haven't heard it before we want to make sure that you know that you You are are loved Thanks for joining us this week on Abolition Radio. We trust that you've been inspired by these stories of hope and survival and that you'll accept our challenge to get involved by contacting us at abolitionradio.org, by liking and sharing our page on Facebook, Facebook slash Abolition Radio, or by making a contribution directly to Love Never Fails. Abolition Radio is the broadcast outreach of Love Never Fails, which is a donor-supported, nonprofit ministry that Vanessa founded as a way of directly impacting the lives of young people who are trapped in or at risk of becoming involved in sex trafficking. This broadcast needs your involvement and support. To find out more, simply go to abolitionradio.org and click on Love Never Fails. Today's program was brought to you in part by Case Industries and with major support from the staff and membership and donors at Faith Fellowship Church. Our theme song, Courage to Believe, is by Justin McRoberts. Hear more about his passion for justice and art at justinmcroberts.com. Our audio engineer is Jarrell Martin, and this is Dave Naderhood. On behalf of Vanessa, Benita, and the whole team at Love Never Fails, Thanks for listening, and thanks even more for taking action to help set captives free. You're in the neighborhoods we live in. You're in the ones we're passing by. You're in the ones we call our neighbors, and the ones who still sleep by.